Hi, I'm here, Victoria, and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, we are looking at evidence-based policing, and that's because you've asked for it. That makes me so happy, right? Because a lot of people hear evidence-based policing and they're like, oh my God, snooze fest. It's not boring. It's actually really good. Using evidence-based practice in policing or any other thing, by the way, that you might want to do, can actually save you bags of time and make sure that you're matching the right resources to the demand. You might have heard of terms such as problem-oriented policing. Hello, that's where it started. So evidence-based policing is fantastic. And it's not what you might think. So when people say evidence and policing, a lot of the time people just assume we're talking about the evidence used to help investigations. So, you know, collecting things like fingerprints, statements, any other stuff you might use to inform your investigations. So if you looked at any of my videos before, I do a lot in terms of forensic science, it's one of my specialisms, and a lot of the stuff I do in relation to evidence has been all about that, um, you know, that material evidence, the, the stuff you'd get in terms of a crime scene. That's what I've been looking at before. This is not that. We are looking at evidence to inform how we do things, how we challenge policies and practices, and make sure that we are doing the right things, rather than wasting loads of time on stuff we don't need to do, which cost it's always been done like that. So there is a thing about culture, isn't there? Where you think, oh, we do it like this because it's always been done like that. And you're like, why? So it's about looking at everything, questioning stuff and making sure you're doing it properly. You're rather than being on the back foot all the time reacting to stuff, you're proactively looking at how we're going to tackle these problems without having to waste loads of time, cause us issues and make sure that we're utilising our limited resources very, very effectively. Okay, so I actually, one of my colleagues, um, when we were in police training, noticed that we were doing everything kind of twice on two different systems. And this is just a basic example. And he was like, why are we doing this? And I'm like, oh, well, you know, we need to keep these records for the audit trails. Yeah, but do you need two? I tried it by doing just one more comprehensive one. <gasps> it worked. It reduced, like, workload by a load, made the team more effective so we could go and actually do more with the staff we had. It was super good. It just by challenging those policies and things, just thinking just because you've always done it like that doesn't mean you should. And there is no such thing as a copper's nose. I mean, they've all got noses, I think. All the ones I've met have noses. But your intuition is great, yeah? Well done on having a good sense of whatever Spider-Man senses you've got. But you need actual evidence and stuff. You can't just do things because you feel like it or you think it's a good idea. What you want to be making sure you're doing is doing things properly because you've actually thought about it, you've rationalised things. You should have already, if you're watching this video, because a lot of you I know are in training or active police officers, or you're just interested in crime and policing. So I'm hoping that you've got some idea about the national decision model. The national decision model is a fantastic tool in terms of how to react and respond to things and to make those decisions um, quickly and to ensure you're doing things properly. That's all about gathering information, intelligence, assessing the threat and the risk, your options and contingencies, I could do the whole thing. Anyway, it's all about that kind of stuff before you go and do something or when you are looking at, um, you're writing up what you've done and you think, right, I've done this, this and this, I did it because of that, I did it because of that, blah, blah, blah. People use it as a tool in terms of a reflection model, but it's also what you're supposed to use before you actually go to an incident. I use the NDM all the time. Like when I'm dealing, I've got a 10 year old, well, I'm dealing with my daughter um, and she, I need to think about stuff. I need to think, right, what do I know? What could I do? And just, you know what I mean? I've got, I use the NDM all the time because it helps you to like properly focus on what's important rather than just going like that, which is really, really important. When you are a police officer and you've got to make decisions quickly, it's important that you do it rationally. You can't see, there's a whole training course we do called the Red Mist Training. So you might have had that already. And that's where you feel like, it's so funny, I'm laughing now, where it was called Sean Hancock, one of my fellow trainers, call me a baseball bat and shout at him and they're like, ah! And it's how, how you react to stuff basically, how to, to just be rational and not fly off the handle at this dude with a baseball bat. Anyway, I digress. We're looking at evidence-based policing. Now, when you think about evidence-based practice, this happens across lots and lots of different organisations, lots of different professions. And one that I always draw on when I talk about evidence-based stuff is like medicine. So gone are the days when you would stick a leech here, there and everywhere to try and cure your ailments. 
what we do now is we have stuff like, you know, paracetamols, antibiotics, you know, medicine that works. And that's because lots of research was done into like, wow, well, all right, so how do I get rid of this headache? Hmm. Well, currently we put a leech in your ear, etc. You know, looked at what we did at the time, went, eh, this, this isn't working. Let's try something else. Well, did you know you can use this as this, even herbal stuff, which will get rid of your headache. I mean, you don't have to put a leech in your ear. And it's developed over time. Research develops. They apply that. They test it. Not on animals, I hope, anymore. And then they share the, the testing. So a question will become, how do we solve this? Then they'll be like, right, well, currently we, we've got this and this. Yeah. Why don't we try that? Then try that. And then they share the results. That's how it works in medicine. Why don't we do that everywhere else? Well, my friends, we do now. We do it in policing anyway. This is kind of a new approach, although we have been doing POP for years, which is problem-oriented policing, which is evidence-based policing. Um, that was conceived by an American criminologist called Herman Goldstein. And that's, he developed the POP models, the problem-oriented policing. And that's where he looked at a specific problem and drilled into that one. Now, Goldstein's work really did... Um, kick off the whole evidence-based policing thing. And that is when we get our next big thinker in EBP, evidence-based policing, who is Professor Larry Sherman. Now, Professor Larry Sherman is kind of like the dom of evidence-based policing. And he says it's all about what works. In fact, I will read a quote to you right now. Ahem. It's a method of making decisions about what works in policing, which practices and strategies accomplish police missions most cost-effectively. It makes sense. To not use evidence-based policing doesn't make sense. To do things because we've always done it like that certainly doesn't make sense. Because have a think about something you might have done because you've always done it like that. Maybe, okay, I drive to work a specific route because I've always driven there. Maybe it's the way the bus goes and I used to catch a bus before I could drive. So I will drive that way because that's the way I know. However, if it might be more effective to go a different route it might save time money resources to a different route and that's what you do if you use a sat nav right so when you put your sat nav on and you're driving somewhere um I, I use mine on my iphone and it'll say things like save 10 minutes by going up wickersley or something and i'll press it and i'll save 10 minutes on my journey that's because that is using evidence to inform that decision that's what we should be doing as well so we already know that a lot of other professions use evidence-based practice teachers use it so I'm an academic. My last, I don't know how many years I've been in education um, as a teacher and learning quality lead and obviously as a lecturer. And um, we always inform practice with evidence-based practice. It's always evidence-based because things are always emerging and always changing as it is in crime, which is why we need to adopt it in policing too. So here is something for you scholars out there. If you are using this video for an assignment or something at university or college or whatever, and you want to put some um, like some sources in there, you want to cite something, I want you to look at Bryant and Bryant 2019. And I'm going to tell you now what they did. So they have like adopted this five-step approach in terms of evidence-based policing. And they are as such. So I'm reading this for you now from there. So you might want to use this if you do in your work. So um, there are five distinct stages in any evidence-based policing project, which are you state the question, gather the existing evidence, Assess the existing evidence and undertake research. You implement the findings and you evaluate the implementation. All of those stages are really, really important. But the third stage where your evidence is being um, assessed is probably the most important and maybe the most challenging as well. Now then, so the College of Policing are amazing. I get a lot of my stuff from the College of Policing Authorised Professional Practice. That's because it's current, it's correct and it's direct from the source. The College of Policing regulate policing. They do all the things in terms of how to professionalise a policing service. And that doesn't just mean things like, you know, your honesty and integrity, stuff like that. It means how we're professionalising it moving forward. So about having those right skills, qualifications, like doctors and nurses, it becoming a proper profession, like teaching. Because it is. The skills that you have as police officers are professional. So let's make it like that. Let's professionalise it. So you get your little professionalism badge. Let's do that. And so, College of Policing are fantastic. I cannot rate them enough. Um, give me a job. I'm, I'm joking, I love my job. Um, but you can send me some free books if you like. So anyway, yeah, they have got something called the Crime Reduction Toolkit. This is 
great. If you're interested in looking at things in terms of evidence-based policing, you can see all the things they're already doing. So projects are doing, projects have done, the impact they've had, and the models that they've used. It really helps you get your head around things. One in particular I found super interesting was about uh, the prevention of relationship violence or the reduction of it, which I'll go through in a little minute with you. They do use a model in order to assess the effectiveness of, of things, which I'll go through with you now. Now, I'm going to read this straight from there, which is the MA model. So E double M I E. So E is effect. Now, that's the impact it has on crime. That's whether the evidence suggests the intervention led to an increase, decrease or had literally no impact on crime. Like, well, that was useless. Next. OK, the next one. So the first M is mechanism. That's how it works. So what is it about the intervention that could explain its effect? OK, the next M is moderators. Now, that's where it works. In what circumstances and context is the intervention likely to work and not to work? Implementation is how you do it. So what conditions should be considered when implementing an intervention locally? Then the economic cost, obvious, how much it costs. So what direct and indirect costs are associated with the intervention and is there evidence of cost benefits? So that is your ME model. And this is what you use to assess things. Now we are going to look at um, maybe local crime towards me. I am based in South Yorkshire, if I couldn't give that away with my um, Tennyson's relish. I do love a bit of endos. I've gotten everything. So evidence-based policing happens when worlds collide in terms of academic and policing worlds. Did you know loads of the academics that teach on your policing courses, so your PCDAs, your um, professional policing degrees, your DHEP courses, are all from the policing family. So they'll all have some kind of specialism, which is why they've been put into those roles. So you're not just being taught by someone who's read a book about policing. These are people who've been involved in that world. It might, whatever roles they are, they all bring something to the table and the modules that they're given are specific because of that experience. Um, and you get, you really do get an excellent service. So I'm just bigging ourselves up there. Anyway, so when we are looking at um, evidence-based policing, the people who are doing the research and stuff, you'll have your academics and you'll have your policing people together. So people who are actively already in the force still, people who are the academics, and they work together on these projects. So whatever university you are with, if you're at a university, will have some kind of projects, I imagine, if they're doing policing degrees. And there is lots of stuff on the College of Policing Crime Reduction Toolkit, which I do read because I am a massive nerd. Okay, so now we're going to look at a specific um, crime area so we can apply a little bit of this evidence-based policing or at least review what they have done. So the question I'm going to ask is, how do we reduce the number of crime in relation to relationship violence? That is our question. How do we reduce the number of crimes in relation to relationship violence? And that is because so where I'm based in South Yorkshire, Hendos, um, there is a prevalence of domestic violence and domestic abuse it is on the rise. It is it's bad. I mean, that's everywhere as well. Like nationally, domestic violence is a key um, priority. It's a huge crime. Um, at every domestic violence job, you do need to do a dash. But that is for a different video. But what we are looking at now, obviously, is how to how we're going to reduce this, how we're going to prevent these crimes. What is happening? Where does it start? We know the crime is like this. What we want to do is get in there and stop it. And that is because we don't have unlimited resources. We need to make sure we match our resources to demand. We know 30 years ago, we employed loads of police officers. After about 30 years, they retire. So due to natural attrition, we have lost a load of our workforce. We need to bolster that up again. However, we know that in 2010, there was a freeze on recruitment because we just did not have the money. It was a time of government austerity. There was no money, no recruiting. Soz. So that meant we got used to this working, kind of like doing the things we always did, maybe not always in the best ways, on limited resources. Had a massive impact on staff well-being, um, obviously on the response to, to incidents and to public confidence. Now, there's an operation called Operation Uplift, which I think quite quite nice, quite uplifting really. And that is where we are recruiting police officers Bring them on in. We are now recruiting. In fact, on January the 3rd, South Yorkshire Police opened their recruitment. So if you are looking to join the police, you're not yet in there. January the 3rd, South Yorkshire Police will open their recruitment again. Get on the website and apply because we need you if you're good. Don't want any bad eggs. And also you get to work with me. What could be better? Anyway, yeah, so there you go. South Yorkshire Police open January the 3rd. But 
we know that what we've had to do or to adapt is to think better, to use evidence-based policing because we've only got limited resources. We need to match resources to demand. We need to do it properly. Bring in the academics, bring in the policing family, let's all do it together and make sure we can tackle crime. We've all got these different skills, this critical thinking, this evaluation and analytical stuff, along with the experience, is phenomenal. We could conquer the world, guys. Anyway, so let's look at this question. So how do we prevent crime in relation to relationship violence? That is the big question, because we know it's prevalent and it sucks, right? We know that. Terrible for victims, terrible for the community, and it's not great for the offender either, is it? So here we go. How do we prevent crime in relation to relationship violence? Okay, so the next step, that's our question. This is our, our five steps mentioned earlier. The first question, that's to state the question, we've just done that. Um, then we need to gather some info and intel, don't we? What do we know about it already? It sounds a bit like the NDM, right? So what do we know about this already? We know the numbers are up here. We know that um, in relation to the age groups and stuff, it, where it starts, we can have a look at all that kind of stuff, can't we? Which comes into our assessment, which is our third step. The third step is assessment. So we've done the question, we've gathered what we already know about it, and now we're going to assess that. We know that relationship violence is prolific. We know that, I've just mentioned that 18 times. What we also know is that research is actually going in to implementing, I can't speak, research is going into implementing educational interventions for kind of the younger generation in how to not be violent in a relationship. We know that research has gone into that already. Cool, right? Then we implement the findings. So we're going to test these educational interventions. We're going to test them out. We're going to do lots of different things. And so we're going to do like videos that you can show in your PHSE lessons or in your tutorials at college. We're going to have little community forums, all these different things. We're going to test these educational interventions. Hmm. Then we're going to evaluate how they worked. Perhaps they work better in some settings than others. Go back to the Emmy model. Perhaps the videos are a bit naff because the teachers couldn't, didn't really want to follow it up. Maybe they didn't feel comfortable doing so. Maybe they worked really, really well on videos because then they didn't get distracted. Right, so this is kind of stuff we have to evaluate. So when we get to the evaluation phase then, we figured out that there is some evidence actually that the educational interventions worked. <gasps> Ooh. However, they didn't work enough to statistically have a massive impact or change. Now, that means when we get to our next steps, we need to kind of change it up a little bit. And that might just be in terms of us reframing that question. So we asked the question about how to reduce or prevent crime in relation to relationship violence. We gathered what we already knew about it. We assessed it. Yep, loads. It's prevailing. Ah, uh, help us. Then we thought, right, educational interventions. Let's teach people that this is wrong. This is not good. It might be that someone's experienced that themselves. And it's that cycle that continues. It might be they need some help with their mental health. It might be that COVID was awful and people are still kind of traumatised from it. We don't know. That's what we're looking at. Then we put these educational interventions in. Boom, we're going to test it. Right, okay, we're testing it. Videos, whatever, community forums, that's what they did. Um, and then we're going to evaluate what happened. So we know it worked in some situations. So when it was in the community forums, it worked better than it did on video. We know that. And so now we're like, right, okay, we've got our results in. Yes, there's been an improvement, but not big enough to say a resounding success. Now we need to do more research. So we're going to reframe that question, point it a little bit differently, and then try and impact that way. So rather than just being like, oh, it works a bit, let's continue. Or um, it didn't work as much as we'd like to, sack it off. Now it's right, let's keep going, let's keep going. Let's, let's use the evidence of this to inform our next bit of evidence-based policing research. I hope that makes sense. As you can tell, I'm a huge nerd and I love evidence-based policing because I think it bloody works. It makes sense. Rather than just doing something, hoping for the best results, you are looking at all the best things, what works to inform your decisions. You wouldn't travel to London in a car without a map or a sat-nav. So why on earth would you try and police a type of crime without looking at all the information around you? That's me. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it makes sense. In the meantime, stay safe, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.